uh, I guess if you're ready, let's uh, let's tackle this uh, this lunar uh, Sabbath conspiracy. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I can can make of it so far is that if this thing is true, then you know that's it's the, the Sabbaths have to be on I guess the first and the fifteenth uh, or the, those specific four dates a month. And so I'm I'm turning this completely over to you, Rabbi. Yeah, and <laughs> well, I'm if I were you, I'd do that too. Go, go, yeah, I'm tucking my the, tail on this. Leave me out of this thing. I really can't. Okay. okay. Um, this is going to be. Um, this is going to sound really very strange to even the Christians who are listening to this, and I want to make it clear because we 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 have uh, folks who are. Who are Jewish who've never been Christians who um, who don't send me enough money? I'm kidding. I'm just joking. We have folks who who might think that this what I'm about to describe is a consensus view of Christians, and that is not the case. So I want a full disclosure here that this is would be regarded by every Christian I know as completely not just heretical but absolutely bizarre. Now you're going, what the heck is a lunar Sabbath? I thought, like, if everybody agrees on everything, what, what is, how did you get a lunar Sabbath? Well, as it turns out, though the proponents of a lunar Sabbath say, submit the following, what they are saying is that, in fact, it is an error to identify the Shabbat, the seventh day of the week, or Sunday, as Christians would do. Ignatius, incidentally, was the first Christian to propose that uh, Christians uh, celebrate uh, Sunday as a Sabbath. Oh, it would take a while for that to get in, but he was the guy who launched that. Uh, Bishop of Antioch, okay, so let's get him. I'm kidding. Anyway, um, so the early Christians didn't believe this, but what they are saying is that, where do I begin? That the the Sabbath is identical to the new moon. The new moon, in fact, is the Sabbath. And therefore, Sabbath, when the Shabbat is the day of rest, the Sabbath day, which is holy, a holy convocation to the Lord your God, it's blessed by the Lord your God, uh, that really has nothing to do with Saturday or Sunday. But rather, uh, what you do is you take a, a month, so if... <laughs> Wow. So if uh, you have, so it would be therefore the uh, the Shabbos would come out, have nothing to do with Saturday and Sunday, but rather it would be on the ninth day, on the 22nd day, and the 29th day of every month, thus counting seven days from the uh, from the new moon from Rosh Chodesh. Now you're going, how the heck did anyone come up with that one? Well, as it turns out, it actually... I'm not going to say it's not that crazy, but it is one of the less crazy things, because it is based. It is based on a a misunderstanding that, in fact, many people have made. If you read any of their literature of the lunar Sabbath, they'll tell you that the first time the Shabbat is mentioned is in, in Exodus chapter 16, where, where the Jews are told to observe the Sabbath. And in fact, as you move on in Scripture, you see, and we're very interested in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23, I was going to say, is a really important chapter in the Torah, but I just realized how preposterous that is. But it is a, a chapter you want to sort of make a mental note of, because it is one of the chapters in Scripture which identifies the, um, the days of rest. It goes through the Shabbos, is there, it's in the beginning of Deuteronomy, uh, of Leviticus 23, but then as Leviticus 23 unfolds, it begins to identify holidays like uh, Passover, like Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, like that these are all Sabbaths, okay? So, for example, if you look at Leviticus 23, verse 32, that would be the Day of Atonement. In verse 39, that would be the festival of Sukkot. Well, when does the festival of booths or tabernacles or Sukkot begin? Well, it's based on the, the uh, new moon. It's the 
the 15th day of the seventh month. Okay? So, therefore, and it says, it shall be a, a, a Sabbath to you. What? Sabbath? So they're going, whoa, if in fact the holidays are called a Sabbath, and even uh, the book of, uh, even the festival of, of um, Shavuot, the, the, the festival of what Christians call Pentecost, the Torah doesn't give us the date of the, fe- the festival of Shavuot, it simply tells us that we begin countering, counting Mimacharas HaShabbos, which means the, the, the day after the Shabbat, okay, that's what it sounds like, right? And we count 49 days, and bingo, you've got Shavuot. Well, someone's going, well, Jews don't do that at all. We actually start counting from uh, the day after the first day of Passover. W- why is Passover called the Shabbat? Why is Sukkot, why are the festivals of Israel called a Sabbath? Now, in fact, if you look at Leviticus 23, it becomes very clear because we see there earlier on, as I mentioned, that uh, it, the Day of Atonement, which is the 10th day of the month, which is... That's not that wouldn't work out to anything. Is also a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath of Sabbath, and you surely afflict your soul. But the question, now I know that some people watching are going, wait, what's going on here? Why is Passover? We are told that Passover should be a Shabbat, should be a Sabbath. I, I thought it's the seventh day. Well, this is what confuses everyone. This is what gets everyone into a lot of trouble, and one of the things that. We've discovered, those of you who have been uh, following the, sh- the broadcast we've been doing, is that I- I've emphasized the fact of how important it is to read the Jewish scriptures in the original Hebrew. If you don't read the Jewish scriptures in the Hebrew, you're, you're, if you're reading a King James, you're actually reading largely a translation of the Tyndale Bible, which is, Tyndale is really a translation of the Vulgate, which is a mess translation of the Hebrew. Jerome could speak Hebrew, and in fact died in the land of Israel, but he altered the text, the, which, and he's the primary author of the Latin translation. You're getting something, a text that's... Incidentally, even if I translated the Bible into the English language, you would not be getting remotely the Word of God, because in order to make it readable, given that the structure of Hebrew and English are entirely different, Hebrew is a Semitic language, I have to write it, anyone with the best intentions has to write it, uh, rewrite the text in a way that's just readable. And if I just translate it word for word, you could try doing this with an interlinear, you see it's just not readable. So every translation is treason, and it is. It is the word of men, it's not the word of God. Sometimes you have no choice, you need a wheelchair, but you always help to get better and be able to read in the original. You want to get off those crutches, okay? That's important. So the key point is the mistake people frequently make is that the Hebrew language is a rather small language. It's a very tiny lexicon. In contrast to the English languages, I don't know if it's the largest language in the world, but it's close. Enormous. The Hebrew Bible, biblical Hebrew is small. There are not that many words, and in fact, one word can mean many, many different things. And they're often related. And Shabbos is one of them, and that's what gets everyone in trouble. Shabbos is the day of Sabbath, the day of rest. Of course, it is the seventh day of the week. But as it turns out, Shabbos, really, why is it called Shabbos? Because really, it is a, it is a verb. And in fact, we can encounter the, sh- the word Shabbos in the, in, when we're introduced to God sanctifying the seventh day. That's in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 1, just so you get this, is the create, God creating the world, and it's a summary of God creating the world. No details, no breakdown of Adam and when his wife were created or how she was created, none of that. It's just giving you the, the headline. What happens in Genesis 2 is, what, what, what doesn't happen in Genesis 2 is, fish are not discussed. They're not important. We know already from Genesis 1, God is the, the creator, ex nihilo. Uh, he is, he is Shochenad 
Isaiah 57, verse 15. He stands outside of creation. He is the master. He's the creator of the universe. Genesis 2, then, steps back, but steps back to focus on what's critical. The world was created for the purpose of mankind, not for animals. I know you love your cats and dogs, but no, they're there to be your companion. I know you consider them family, and some of you are thinking about having them do your tax return. They can't do it. Let's, so I want to illustrate this to you, and um, I, I want to you follow along. I'm going to open this up here, and I'm going to read this. These words, incidentally, will be very familiar to Jews. Why? Because as it turns out, in Genesis chapter 2, in the opening passages, the Hashem sanctifying the Shabbos is in fact the opening paragraph of the Kiddush, when we make the blessing over the wine. We begin with this. So therefore, the words I'm going to read are very familiar. I'm going to read them in Hebrew and translate them. And they're going to be very familiar with every Jew who's ever heard uh, Kiddush uh, read aloud. And you'll see where, in fact, the, where the word Shabbos comes from. The Shabbos is not really is from a verb, and then it, it becomes the noun, the Shabbos. But th- so I'm going to, we'll start with Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. We'll just go through two passages, and these are, in fact, the first passages where we have Shabbos. The, the people who ascribe to the lunar Sabbath will tell you, and this is I don't care where you look this up. They will tell you that the first time you find the Sabbath mentioned in the Bible is Exodus chapter 16. They're wrong. And this is the foundation of their error. Okay? They're wrong because, in fact, the first place we find the Shabbos is in Genesis chapter 2. But you won't see it on their website. They don't know it. Well, I don't know what they know, really. I didn't give them a Rorschach test, but I'm just going to presume they don't know. Some of these people must be sincere. So the key is, let's just take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And God completed the, his work, which means the six days of creation, which he created. And here's the word. Vayishbos. What's the word of that word? The, what, what word is in there? Shabbat. But what does that word mean? And he rested on the seventh day after creation, not new moons. There we go. So that's where their whole error is. Now, in fact, I know that when we began to address the idea of a lunar Sabbath, you're going, wait, everybody hold the show. I need to change the battery in my pacemaker. But what... <laughs> this is a um, this is um, symptomatic of many of the problems that it's the same. It, the word means two different things, and people just say it means the same thing. It doesn't. And let's go to verse three. Here, Hashem. Notice also, incidentally, because the nation of Israel have not been identified yet, that's going to happen. Genesis is really a book overarching about the major theme is God um, discovering a family that he can work with, a royal family. That's really what Genesis is about. So the commandment to keep Shabbat is going to come later because we don't have a family yet who's going to keep Shabbat. But God is sanctifying Shabbat immediately. The book of Exodus is, of course, many things, uh, but one could say it is the establishment of not the royal family, but the royal nation, the children of Israel. Let's go to verse 3. This we say again every Friday night in Kiddush. Vayivorech Elohim es yeim hashvi'i vayikadesh yisai. And God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. Why? Here's our next words. Ki vay shavas. Because it was in fact on the seventh day, not on the day after the new moon. The new moon is not a Sabbath. None of that is correct. Because he, here's the verb, because 
because he rested from all his work, he abstained, he stopped creating, he ended the creation process on the seventh day. So Shabbos means he rested. Now, the Shabbos really means, we see over here, the root of the word is what? It really is to halt working. They want to not engage in any sort of um, in any sort of work because this is important. Like, why is this important? Well, as it turns out, you know, when we think about as humans, the 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 object of God's creation, we're, we're sometimes can be self-absorbed, and we think about the the history of of we think about, well, God created the world and it started then. But as it turns out, God existed, Shochenad. He's the God of eternity. He sits on eternity. He, God was there long before the world was created. And I have other news for you. He didn't need us. There is absolutely nothing you have that God lacks that He requires from you in order to improve his conditions. He was doing perfectly fine without the universe. And I know this may deflate your ego, but in fact that isn't that is the case. So why then did Hashem create the universe and create men? It was not that Hashem needed it. It's not that Hashem wanted everyone to say all these these great platitudes, oh you're great, oh you're so good, you're the best God. I knew that this is you, the God, the God, and God is God. Oh, my ego is so happy that you're saying all these nice things about me. It's not at all the case. He didn't need any of this. But it really is to elevate mankind. So what did God do? He created a, 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 a universe for the purpose of mankind. That's why when man was created, God said, this is very, very good. This is very, very special. That was the object of all mankind. How is mankind different than any other creature? Man has the spark of God, Ruach Kim, inside. We have a divine spark in us, but we are also created from the clay of the earth. We have two things in us. We have the animal instinct in us, I understand the little doggies who stand, sit at dinner table and just pr- hoping. They're not praying because they don't know anything about God. No dog ever believed in God. But a dog is sitting there going, I got eyes going, go, oh, won't you please give me a piece of that steak? Throw me something, right? Well, you know, when you look at the dog and you look at your, whatever, your cat just go staring at you, I think you can probably identify with that. I, if I were a dog, I'd be sitting there and I'd want the steak rather than the garbage you put in my, my bowl. I'm, I, I get the dog because I'm made out of the same material that the dog is. I get the whole deal with the dog. I know why they want my food more than their food. I get it. It makes perfect sense to me. But dogs are not created in the image of Hashem. They're here for many reasons. They're here to teach us loyalty. But they are created only from the earth. No dog knows it's going to die. No dog uh, knows there's a god. No animal, creature in the world, knows there's a god except for mankind. Now, all the creatures of the earth display the wisdom of Hashem, for sure. We won't go into it because we're going to... But the key point is the human being also has... A chelik mimal, which means that God has infused us with His Spirit, which means there's a divine spark in us, in Yeshom inside of us, and therefore we stand erect, we stand vertical. The animals are like this, they're all ground, front to back, but we are up and we are down. And therefore Hashem created a world um, in which we would have complete free will. I have put place before you good and evil, life and death. You must choose good that you might live. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 14 through 19. Read the text for yourself. God has created the world where man has complete free will and he has stepped out. God does know the decisions we'll make only because of his foreknowledge, but we can choose one or the other. He just happens to be stand outside. He is not bound by his own creation. And therefore, what Hashem has asked us to do is this. Hashem created for six days a universe that operates on laws that God doesn't need. Laws of thermodynamics. He doesn't need those laws. Those are laws specially for 
this place we live in. He built a house for us. He built a home for us, specially designed for us, based on the laws of our uh, that we need in our natural world, a highly fine-tuned world. And the Yavah Hashem has turned to us and said this, I want you to build a house for me too. But just like I built... Um, just like I built a home for you, not on any laws that have anything to do with my, God doesn't need 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, pretty close with some other trace gases, doesn't need any of that stuff. We need photo, photo, uh, photosynthesis, we need all that stuff. He says, I created a world based on laws I don't need, you need. You are going to build a temple for me, but here's the key. You're going to build a temple for me based on laws that have nothing to do with you. Purity and impurity, you have no idea what those things mean. It's okay, but one thing, be sure. You need to be kedoshim to you, ki kodesh ani Hashem alikechum. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You are, in fact, selam elokim. You are created in the image of God, and therefore you are to imitate me. And therefore, for six days, you too are created. You're going to create a temple based on laws. But one thing is, is don't you dare build any house for me. Don't you dare build anything on Shabbos, because you have to mimic me. Which means that we have to rest on Shabbos, just like God rests on Shabbos. Read Exodus 31. I'm feeling it all over. I'm sure you are too. And that's what Hashem says. And incidentally, who is the person who is given the authority to uh, build this house of God? Remember, God built us a house, and in turn, we built Him a house. Why? Because we're creating God's name. If you think that's maybe a homily, or I'm just spinning words for you, I'm not. Who are Who did Moses ordain to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. What were their names? As it turns out, one of them, his name is, anybody? Betzalel. What does Betzalel mean? It means you created Betzalel, means Betzalel Melikim. It's a compression of image of God. Who is the other person who accompanied him on this major task, who God bestowed upon him his spirit so that they would be able to engage in this extraordinary task of building a, 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 a place, a house for God, not based on the principles of the our world, thermodynamics, no. There's this purity, impurity, we don't even know what that means. It's not part of our world, it's God's world. We are in turn now acting like God. You shall surely go in his ways. That means as he is kind, so should you be kind. Our job is to imitate Hashem. And therefore, who is the other person who accompanied Mr. Tzalem uh, Elohim, B'Tzalel? There it is. You're created B'Tzalem Elohim. You're going to create a house for me. Who's the other one? His name is Ohaliyav. What does that mean? Ohel Av. What does Av mean? Father. What does Ohel mean? House. A tent. A tabernacle. Whoa! So as it turns out, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, blessed be His holy name, Select is telling us, it's so delicious, it's dripping on your tongue. You want to just jump into Scripture. This is why my friends... Forget your golf games and your stupid television shows. Throw your TV out the window and save your children's lives. Listen, Kindleuch. Know the Hebrew. Understand God's kisses and love for the whole Torah. So you, are to, you who are creating the image of Hashem are to create a house for God, just like God built your house. And just as God was Shavas, which means he rested, which means he stopped creating, you have to too stop creating on the seventh day. Ah, so delicious. Therefore, let's bring this now to a full circle, holy children of the Most High. 
therefore, the word Shabbos has a double meaning. It can mean, as we see in the opening of, Gen- of Leviticus 23, that it's referring to the Sabbath, and it's a noun, it's the Shabbos. But the word really, it, it, it sources that it is a, a time of rest. Well, as it turns out, and this is where they, this is the disconnect. This is the two dots, they just, they don't connect. And that is, the word Shabbos also means what? Not just the Sabbath, but also means a time when you are resting, where you do no work. Bingo. And as it turns out, the Torah says, there are other days besides the Shabbat that you need to rest. What are those days? Well, they're uh, Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, on the, on, the, um, on the first day of the seventh month. That's Sukkot. It's, you must rest on that day. Now, yeah, if you're reading your new international version, you're going to see the word rest. But if you go into the Hebrew, it's Shabbat. So they, they say it's, that means, oh, that's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is based on the lunar. That's what they're doing. But they don't get it that the word Shabbos means rest. It's Shabbos, Shabbos, Son Yilchem. You should, it, um, uh, Yom Kippur is a Sabbath of Sabbaths. You must abstain from any kind of work and you should afflict your soul. Same thing for Passover. And here is the list. So what they're doing is they're conflating uh, every meaning of Shabbat, meaning the seventh day, which now we know what it really, what its source is, and conflating that with the uh, with the commandment that Saturday, the seventh day of the week, is not the only time that it's forbidden to engage in work. There are other days as well. And those days where you must have a Shabbat, meaning you must have a, a an, no work, you must rest, is also on the festivals, such as Tabernacles, Shemini Atzeres, which would have been the eighth day, such as Yom Kippur, one may not engage in any work, just the, the festival of, of, of Shavuot, the festival of weeks, just the festival of Passover, those are also a Shabbat, those are also a day of rest. One other point is that, um, that uh, Rosh Chodesh is, that means the first day of the month, is a celebration, it is a a festive time, it is. And there was very special things that happened on the first day of the month, celebrating Rosh Chodesh, which we read from the Torah in every synagogue. Uh, it is a great, but it is not a day that one has to abstain from work. Um, that isn't correct at all. It is sort of a, a minor uh, holiday. We don't have the command to abstain from work. And we can see that. If you, uh, For example, uh, if you look at um, Ezra chapter 7, verse 9, uh, just so you know this about the book of Ezra, this might surprise you. It's called the book of Ezra, but we're not introduced to Ezra until chapter 7. That's right. So there we're told that, well, Ezra comes, travels to the land of Israel later on. The Jews had come there earlier under the leadership of of a priest, Yeshua ben Yehotzadok, and Zerubbabel, and um, Ezra stayed back for a while because he was attending to his his uh, teacher, Baruch ben Nuria, who was a disciple of Jeremiah. And then it tells us in in um, in Ezra that in fact it was on Rosh Chodesh, it was on the first day of the month that he actually left Babylon, and it was on the first day of the month that he traveled into Jerusalem. Now as it turns out, the Torah says that you're not allowed to leave your place on the Shabbos day. That would be forbidden to do on the Sabbath. So you see openly that that new moons is a day of celebration, and we do see that in Ezekiel 46 verse 1, that on Shabbos and on new moons, the gates are remain open, and they use that, but they're all confused. There are special celebrations, but one can work, one can travel, and we see that openly in the scripture, but it all comes from a lack of knowledge of God's Hebrew word, and, and therefore seeing the word Sabbath, and that, that festivals are called the Shabbos, which means that there are time you must rest, and Komal, how do you know I'm telling you the truth? What am I going to say? Read it Read it for yourself. It says, because you, it says there, kol melech sasu. It actually says that. It, the modifiers are all there. It is a day that you're not allowed to do any melech. Uh, there are, on, on there, it's slightly less, I'm talking about um, the festival of Passover, I'm not going to go into why, but the festival of Passover and Sukkot and Shavuot, uh, we you could cook and carry uh, go, going back to Exodus 12, for example, 
it's beyond the scope of this program. But the key is these are days that one is not allowed to go to work, one ha is not allowed to work on the 15th day of Nisan. That's a day to celebrate Passover. The whole confusion comes up with thinking that Shabbos uh, is, every time Shabbos appears, that must be the, that must be the Sabbath. That they are the same. And once you conflate it, you find yourself in spiritual la la land. There's your answer. Adon olam, asher malach, v'terem kol yetzir nivra, v'et nasa, v'chev tzokol, azai melech, azai melech, shemu nikra, v'acharei kichlot akol, לבדו, ימלוך נורא, והוא היה, והוא הווה, והוא הווה, והוא יהיה בתפארה. אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחץ הכל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם אף נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחץ הכל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם אף נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אזי מלך, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה